Um, Chris sends um, his apologies. He uh, couldn't be here. But it, it's really a pleasure to introduce uh, Don DeMeo, who's just a, a wonderful researcher and a, a great friend. And um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, Don graduated from Yale and Cornell with honors and came to Brigham uh, to do her internal medicine residency in 1995. Um, she did her training in pulmonary and critical care medicine here at the Harvard Combined Programs and at the Channing, um, what's now called the Channing Division Network of Medicine. It wasn't then. Um, and she spent a decade uh, attending a lung transplant services and attending, doing a wonderful job there and helping patients. And she now specializes in COPD. Um, her first grant was in 2003, and it was to study gender and COPD. And this really started a career passion for her to understand the genetics and epigenetics and genomic features of sex and gender differences in lung diseases. And she's going to tell us a little bit about her research, asthma and COPD, sex and gender considerations. Dawn, thank you so much. Thank you, Elliot. And thank you all for, for coming a week late, but here we are. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here, and as Elliot said, this is my 20th year at the Brigham, um, so it's a great honor to be giving these grand rounds in that celebration. So I'm going to give a general overview. Dr. Fanta tasked me with covering asthma and COPD in 50 minutes, so we'll see how that proceeds. So we'll, we'll talk about observations across the, across the life course, and we'll consider asthma, ACOS, the asthma COPD overlap syndrome, and COPD. We'll talk briefly about hormone issues, but then really have an opportunity to discuss at the end how sex and gender considerations dovetail with the goals for precision medicine. So when we talk about sex and gender, we really need to parse these topics. Sex is really related to the presence of the X chromosome. We think of sex as being relevant to genetics, hormones, other biologic influences, and is a key driver of differences in airway anatomy. And then gender are more in the social constructs, environmental considerations, the effects of air pollution. Um, now on the rise is the consideration of the role of gender identity in medicine, um, more in the lung because of the use of exogenous um, hormones in people who are undergoing gender transitions. But we won't talk about this today, but I refer you to this wonderful paper in the Blue Journal by Ken Pinkerton. So when we think of sex and gender, we really have to put this in a historical construct. So in the 1800s, for the first time recorded, during the popular health movement, men and women were considered different. But then in the decades that followed, they were once again considered the same. And really in 2001, the Institute of Medicine codified the reason to study sex as its own biologic variable. They suggested that barriers to the advancement of our knowledge in medicine um, must be eliminated. In part, this would be achieved by studying sex. But perhaps an additional and more general reason to study sex differences to gain important insights into underlying biologic mechanisms. And that's the approach we've taken at the Channing. So many of us are interested in the life course approach and what happens to the lung during development. We can really start thinking in utero when we think of lung disease and the genesis of lung disease differences by sex. We know early on that um, female infants and female fetuses have difference in overall movements. Um, surfactant development is earlier in females than in males, but then during childhood, especially during the prepubertal years, we know that the development, the differential development in lung growth in baby boys and, and boys versus girls can lead to some of the architectural issues that can contribute to asthma differences in childhood. And then these changes progress across the life course, and we'll talk about those in a moment. So if we think of asthma, there's a very um, well-studied series of, of epidemiology studies from the early 70s that looked at sex differences in asthma. And in a, in a study from Broder and colleagues, almost 50 percent of, of patients had the onset of asthma before 10 years, as we say at the Channing. It's all over before age 6. And if we really look in that 6 to 10 group of children, we see a male predominance of asthma. And this is prior to the hormonal surge, so we really think that these are more likely to be structural issues. Um, when we start to see the, the onset of puberty, we see an equal representation of asthma um, incidence and prevalence, but then at, after the pubertal stage, this flip-flops where we see more females with asthma through the rest of the life course. This was recapitulated by Dodge and Ben Burroughs, um, where they reviewed data from more than 3,000 individuals and, again, noted that females had a lower incidence of asthma during early childhood, but as we looked later in the life course, the incidence was greater in girls and women, especially in women over the age of 40. And we'll talk about this again in the context of ACOS and COPD. 
So a take home point here is that there are many studies, two of which I've highlighted, that asthma in early life tends to be a, a disease of boys, whereas after the pubertal switch, this is really common in girls and women. So if we think of this in the context of asthma severity, there have been some early studies that review hospital admission rates. And under age 10, boys were admitted almost as twice often as girls for asthma and manifest more severe asthma. But again, during the second decade of life, these male admissions for asthma decrease. And then we start to see uh, increases amongst girls and women. So in terms even of asthma severity and as a marker of severity hospital admissions, we see this trend uh, being more in female and female asthmatics. Female asthmatics also have longer hospital stays in general. There's a whole host of factors, and this harkens back to the initial slide. Are, is this genetic? Is this hormonal? But this issue of hormonal differences may not come into play until the pubital switch. So what is the issue in boys? Is it an anatomy issue, lung size issue, airway geometry? Are there differences in environmental exposures in kids that are drivers of asthma differences? Or is it in early childhood, are there diagnostic or therapeutic biases? So this is a study that came out of the Channing, um, uh, Dr. Tantasera, Scott Weiss, and Fulbrighi. This is a, a really wonderful analysis of longitudinal data in the CAMP study, where they looked at Tanner stage, so the stage of, of child development, and methicoline responsiveness on the y-axis. These are the girls, these are the boys. And what we see is a divergence in methicoline responsiveness at Tanner stage two, where the girls have no change in their Tanner responsiveness. Um, and actually may get a little more sensitive as they progress through their tanner stages, where in the boys, um, perhaps both associated with a potential protective role for m male hormones, but potentially also for uh, somatic growth, we see a, an increase in methicoline sensitivity across the tanner stages. And dovetailing with this finding is an observation by Salam and Frank Gilligrand's group where they looked at age of menarche and asthma after puberty. And girls who had the onset of menarche after age 12 um, it tended to have lower incidence of adult onset asthma versus those girls that had age of menarche at a younger age. They had a much, much higher risk for post-pubertal development of asthma. So this really re leads to this query about a, a potential role for hormones. Um, we know as clinicians and as researchers, there's this phenomenon of premenstrual asthma, both uh, increase in severity and resource use in the perimenstrual phase. Um, there are issues germane to asthma severity during pregnancy. And then there's the postmenopausal uh, issues associated with asthma. And really, one of the elements lacking in the research here is a real rigorous investigation of how sex steroids influence the airways. Um, but there's a real opportunity now to, to aggressively research these. So if we think of post, uh, perimenopausal, perimenstrual asthma, which used to be called catamenial asthma. There's a, a very rich uh, epidemiologic literature here. The early studies from the 60s suggested a very high prevalence of, of PMA, about 30 percent. More recent studies noted that, and again, a lot of these studies are small, um, but that women who demonstrate an increase in symptoms in the premenstrual phase were older and had longer asthma histories. Um, one of the larger recent studies was in 481 women, where the prevalence of uh, premenstrual asthma was 8.2 percent, but the symptoto symptomatology was much worse. Um, there have been a lot of studies, um, and for those of you who are interested, I'm happy to share this review, it's a little hard to find, that demonstrated, again, a fairly consistent prevalence of, of PMA. If we look at a study from 1992 from JAMA, um, Skoboloff noted that 75% of asthma at patients admitted to hospital were female. Um, and when they evaluated these individuals prospectively, they noted that 46% of, of ER presentations and hospital admissions were during premenstrual phase. And this was recapitulated in a study in the Blue Journal in 2000. From the SARP study, Elliot Israel and other individuals active in SARP noted that, that PMA was associated with aspirin and sensitivity and was also associated with lower uh, FEC and additionally noted more severe symptoms as well as this increased health care utilization. This is one of the most recent studies on perimenstrual asthma. And this study is really one of the first that codified the idea that perhaps we need to think about altered prostaglandins in a role for PMA as well as asthma severity in women.
So the treatment, most patients here respond to usual asthma care. Uh, many require an augmentation of therapy according to their menstrual cyclicity. But this has really not been very well studied, and evidence-based treatment is scant. In fact, Dirkie Postma in 2003 suggested this really needed to be studied more formally, and to date, this has really not been the case. There have been some data for the use of IM progesterone in women with severe PMA, and there's been a question of a role for oral contraceptives. But again, if we look at the studies that have been reviewed on PMA treatment, we see that a lot of them have just been observational, small, uncontrolled studies. The two randomized controlled trials showed no significant change in asthma symptomatology with hormonal modulation. So moving on to asthma in women during pregnancy, um, we know that there are a lot of uh, st uh, structural and functional changes in women during pregnancy. We see we learn during our fellowship and we see as clinicians we, that women who are pregnant have increased minute ventilation and tidal volume. We see decreases in RV and total lung capacity, but unchanged should be respiratory rate and the measurements we really focus on to evaluate clinical asthma. The point here being that women with asthma should be managed like asthma patients and really <clears throat> we need to fully inform patients of how much of asthma can complicate pregnancy. Some of the early studies suggested that about 8% of pregnancies were complicated by asthma. As fellows and as clinicians, we see this 30% rule. 30% uh, of women with asthma will get worse, 30% will get better, and 30% will have no change in their asthma trajectories and status. <clears throat> However, what we do know, and we know for sure, is that lack of therapy of pregnant women can lead to adverse fetal outcomes. And it's really both a concern for the mother and the fetus that motivates um, women to either improve or decrease compliance. And this is really a, a place where we in pulmonary have an opportunity for education. So what we do know also is that severe asthma tends to worsen with pregnancy, and that Exacerbations of asthma are most frequent uh, between 24 and 36 weeks. The fewest symptoms tend to occur after week 37. And exacerbations during delivery, thankfully, are unusual. About three months postpartum, uh, asthma severity tends to revert to pre-pregnancy status. This is generally regardless of lactation choices. Um, and asthma severity does tend to be consistent from one pregnancy to the next. So in this regard, uh, for young women, it is important that they be educated about the opportunities for specialized pulmonary care during their pregnancies, as well as during uh, pre-pregnancy planning. We know that in uncontrolled asthma, there can be very significant maternal complications, including preeclampsia, um, toxemia. Um, we can see a lot of maternal hypoxemia and hypocapnia, and these translate into fetal complications. We do see, uh, in some instances, intrauterine growth retardation, preterm births, uh, as well as uh, neonatal hypoxia. There have been a host of studies um, on this topic. Many of them are, are from the mid-90s. Some of the more recent ones um, show the similar findings. So in the study by Schatz and colleagues in the Blue Journal, the prognosis for perinatal outcomes um, in asthmatic women were as good as non-asthmatic women, again, behooving us as pulmonologists to educate and treat these women aggressively. Um, there have been additional studies <clears throat> that have suggested, and again, this is a slightly older study from 98, suggesting that maternal asthma complicating pregnancy is a significant risk factor for adverse pregnancy outcomes. Again, something intuitive we know as physicians, but the data support aggressive care. And lastly, in a study by Bracken and colleagues, um, they evaluated more than 2,000 pregnancies and noted that preterm delivery was not associated with an asthma diagnosis, um, but that small for gestational age births were increased amongst women um, who had daily asthma symptoms or moderate persistent severity. So again, um, reinforcing the paradigm of excellent control. So, for, again, for those of you who are interested, there have been some excellent reviews on this topic recently, as well as a study published last week, I believe, in Thorax on this topic of asthma and pregnancy risk. This is a, a, <clears throat> a study of, of the prospective studies. So again, a lot of people have been very interested in studying this, but again, I do wonder how much 
our clinical care has, has been born out of what these observations have suggested. So the key points for asthma and pregnancy, pregnancy is a normal condition to which the heart and the lungs adapt. Um, and asthma is one of the most common conditions that complicate pregnancy. But really, excellent asthma care needs to be integrated with high-risk OB um, to really achieve the most excellent outcomes for mother and baby. And <clears throat> controlled asthma is associated with less risk. And we don't really fully understand how hormonal changes during the pregnancy inform the changes in asthma control and severity. So this is a, another area for active research. So what about adult asthma in the midlife? Um, we know that po po postmenopausally we see new onset asthma, but this new onset asthma in the postmenopausal phase is generally quite severe and requires a, a very aggressive therapy, frequently with or high dose oral corticosteroids. Um, postmenopausal asthma as an onset is usually associated without a family history and no history of A to B. So this is what happens during menopause and during the andropause or the change in testosterone levels in men that start to occur around age 50, we also see increased asthma symptoms. So again, this has not been very well studied, but we do know that around midlife uh, that the fluctuations in endogenous steroids do impact asthma control. In terms of women, we know uh, from studies done at the Channing that the risk for new onset asthma has been associated with the use of exogenous estrogens. Uh, there was an initial study uh, by Troisi and then followed up by Graham Barr who extended this analysis. And what Graham noted that in a study of more than 500,000 person years, um, he observed more than 600 cases of new onset asthma in the postmenopausal stage and that <clears throat> age onset relative risks were, were higher in, in postmenopausal women who use estrogen alone. Um, that these, these findings did not change with the duration of estrogen use. And after hormone replacement therapy cessation, the rate of newly diagnosed asthma decreased over time, again speaking for some hormone effects in the midlife. So there have been a lot of studies that when you bring the data together, you synthesize it, we really think that there are hormonal influences on these lung diseases. We know that the sex ratio of asthma is altered at puberty. We know that asthma control can change during pregnancy. We know we have observations both with hormone replacement therapy as well as during testosterone changes during the andropause. Um, but again, uh, these need to be further studied. So what's next for asthma in women versus men? Um, I think there's an opportunity here to study the influence of sex and gender on natural history, to look at hormone influences on lung growth and development. And last week, we just put in a grant to follow up the work of Scott, Kalen, and Anne to add hormone uh, measurements to the CAMP study to really try to plot out what's happening during the life course of children and this trajectory of asthma. We're, we also need to study hormonal influences on immune modulation and airway responsiveness. We need to further understand in asthma the impact of sex and gender on diagnosis and treatment decisions, and does this play into the differences we see in diagnostic rates in boys and girls. Um, we need to further study the genetic, genomic, and epigenetic basis of asthma. And I, it's already a lot to talk about asthma and COPD in one hour. So. Despite my predilection, I am not going to really talk a lot about genetics and genomics and epigenetics, just to say that there have been a lot of studies coming out that have suggested in asthma that there's a sex-specific genetic architecture in asthma. Uh, we ourselves last year published a study that noted an epigenetic footprint related to maternal smoking in the fetal lung, and that this footprint seems to differ by sex. Um, so there are both genetic and epigenetic bases for the asthma that start in utero and proceed across the life course in a sex-specific fashion. So what about when asthma isn't asthma? Well then, is it COPD? And, and this is really where my, my heart lives most of the day. Why study sex differences in COPD? Well, if we look at this, this graph, we know in the year 2000, the number of women dying from COPD surpassed the number of men. This is the first time this ominous trend has been observed, and it really set the course for the need to study this trend further. We also understand that pro projected increase in disease morbidity and mortality will be due to COPD in women. And some people have referred to this trend as an upcoming tsunami or a tidal wave of COPD in women, and I really don't think that's an understatement. So no discussion of COPD, sex, and gender is complete without a brief discussion of tobacco. 
So early in the 20th century, cigarette smoking amongst women was considered immoral, socially contentious. It was radical. In 1934, women consumed only 5% of tobacco. But with the uh, historical coming of the world wars, of women moving out of the home into the workplace, we really start to see this increase over time in the rates of smoking in women. And by the 1960s, we saw this peak in smoking in women. Part of this was fueled by the diabolical ads um, from the cigarette smoking companies that linked tobacco use with beauty, independence, finding a voice, not losing the voice, and strength and independence. And so part of this is fueled by the social dynamics. But it wasn't helped by the Surgeon General reports. In 1964, we saw the first Surgeon General report, Smoking and Health, and it distinctly states that women are not susceptible to the effects of smoking. <laughs> In 1980, this was uh, slightly recanted as the fallacy of women's immunity, and it was suggested that the smoking effects on women will be more prominent in the coming decades. But in 2001, we actually saw the first Surgeon General's report devoted to women in smoking. And in this report is, is a first exhortation to determine whether gender differences exist in the modifying effects of genetic polymorphism on disease risks associated with smoking. And it was this Surgeon General's report that spurned my first grant that Elliot referred to in 2003 on gender and COPD. Last year, in 2014, uh, many of us in the room wrote for the 50 years Surgeon General report, and I actually wrote the chapter on COPD in women, which was the first report that really highlighted this gender issue in, in women in COPD. But again, no discussion of COPD is complete unless we go back to what happens across the life course. So this is a study from Diane Gold, at the, who's at the Channing with us, and Doug Dockery from the school where they looked across six cities and more than 10,000 children. And what they observed were sex-specific effects of direct exposure of cigarette smoking in girls and boys. And when they looked at growth of, of FVC, FEV1, and 2575 in girls and boys that smoked more than five cigarettes a day, we see a marked decrement compared to boys in the girls of lung growth. And what we know is that 70% of people who smoke start smoking during this very vulnerable age of 10 to 18 years of age. And so this is a very ominous trend. So as we think about the scourge of tobacco and women, we really need to think of the <coughs> scourge of tobacco in teenagers and teenage girls specifically. So when we advance forward to COPD, I think this is the picture of COPD many of us are educated with. This is from, uh, from the esteemed illustrator, Frank Netter. This is the classic pink puffer blue boater image. This is the classic image of two white men with emphysema, with COPD, with, excuse me, with uh, chronic bronchitis. And this is the classic image of COPD as a disease of white old men. But this was only further uh, supported by research. And this is research by Shu and colleagues from 1992 which in, a, in the six city studies suggested that the rate of FE1 loss with ongoing smoking was more profound in men, and that men lose more, lost more lung function with smoking when compared to females. However, <clears throat> when we fast forward to the 2000s, we can look first at the Euroscope study, um, which was performed by Watson and colleagues. And in this study, women who smoked <clears throat> lost lung function at a rate of 32 mils per year faster than women with less obstruction. And this was larger than the rate of loss amongst men. Now, perhaps one of the issues that confounds this, this pattern difference is how patients are ascertained to studies. There's, there's never been an excellent comparison there. But, but this has been a finding that's been recapitulated now in other studies. In the lung health study, um, one interesting finding was that upon smoking cessation, we know that pulmonary function improved more with smoking cessation in women than in men. But we also know that women have more difficulties with smoking cessation. So again, a very complicated, interrelated social construct with the biology. But again, women seem to lose more FEV1 than smoking, but gain more with cessation. And this has been nicely reviewed um, by Gan and Don Sin um, in Respiratory Research in 2006, where they summarized 
an enormous amount of data, 55,700 participants, and concluded that if you summarize the data and look beyond age 45 and 50, 50 being this important transition in hormones, that female current smokers had a significantly faster annual decline in FEV1 than male current smokers. So again, again the compendium of the literature continues to support a female susceptibility for lung function decline in cigarette smoking. But, but what about prevalence data in COPD? So, so you can really drive yourself crazy trying to understand how the difference prevalence estimates have, have been developed across country, across changes in ICD-8, ICD-9, ICD-10, how is COPD diagnosed. But there have been some recent uh, reviews on the topic of prevalence estimates in COPD. This is a study by Halbert from 2006. And in that study, they concluded quite definitively that COPD prevalences were higher in men when compared to women worldwide. But then the BOLD study, only a year later, suggests that if we look worldwide, that we really see an equal prevalence of COPD in men and women. This is a slide um, that is from the BRFSS from the CDC uh, Epidemiology Survey Project in COPD. And now what we see by age group <clears throat> is that the prevalence of COPD in women is now surpassed the prevalence in men, at least in the United States, and we are seeing this as a trend worldwide in developed countries. And again, perhaps even more ominously, is the link of this trend to poverty. We know that COPD is a disease with social constructs, that the social constructs impact sex and gender issues related to COPD, and what we see here is if we look at income, family income on the x-axis and percent of population on the y-axis, we see <clears throat> the inexorable link between COPD and poverty in women. So what about diagnosing COPD? What have we understood about the, the trend to diagnose COPD in women versus men? Because of this potential for bias, all of us are educated early on that COPD is a disease of men in some ways. So, <clears throat> Chapman and colleagues tried to address this. It was a really clever study. They presented a hypothetical patient given to 192 primary care providers. So primary care is where care for COPD generally starts. They presented the story of an ex-smoker, 40 pack years with chronic cough, exertional dyspnea, wheeze, and they varied the gender, they varied the age. And what they noted is that it was more often the case that the male patient was correctly diagnosed with COPD. The female patient was usually diagnosed with asthma. And this is not a trend that's germane only to the United States. Mark Miravides followed this up in a study in Spain and found the same exact trend. Uh, these, these biases improved a bit if you use spirometry, but we know in pulmonary that spirometry is generally underused as a diagnostic strategy in primary care. So following on to this, uh, we saw in the confronting COPD survey that symptoms may help in the diagnos against the diagnostic bias and mitigate this diagnostic bias. We know that women are more likely to support severe dyspnea despite lower pack years of smoking. Um, this was also noted by Wanda Torres, who noted for a similar degree of physiologic impairment, women had more uh, dyspnea and, and greater functional impairment. This also feeds forward into COPD comorbidities. And there have been several, there have been many studies, including uh, data from COPD gene that suggests a higher prevalence of COPD comorbidities in women. What we also note from this study by DeMarco is that women with COPD tend to report more anxiety and more depression. And that dyspnea was more strongly correlated with depression in women. But why is this important? Um, we know that the risk of rehospitalization for COPD is increased in patients with anxiety and depression and lower health status. And now with a lot of interest on drivers of COPD readmission rates, it really behooves us to look at our admission, readmission rates by sex and really understand what the comorbidities, including these psychological comorbidities, which seem to, to stymie women's ability to improve after an exacerbation. Um, there have been a lot of nice reviews recently on gender differences in symptomatology, again, highlighting the sex differences in depression and anxiety as, as co-drivers of COPD exacerbations. And again, the differences in chronic cough and sputum, women tend to have more cough and sputum than men, as well as increased dyspnea. 
One of my favorite studies on sex and gender in COPD came out in 2007. This is a study from the NET trial where Fernando Martinez and colleagues looked at CT scan data and quality of life data from NET. Um, what they noted again here was that women with COPD reported more dyspnea and had lower self-reported uh, lung health status. But interestingly, they tended to demonstrate less overall densitometric emphysema, especially in the periphery of the lung. When they looked histologically at the samples that were resected for lung volume reduction surgery, they also noted histologically women had thicker airways and smaller lumens. So this started this different dialogue. Okay, we understand that men and women both get COPD, but maybe emphysema is a phenotype of men. And so many studies have published on the increased rates of emphysema in men with COPD compared to women, but in, on an analysis that Megan Harden and I have been working on in the COPD gene study, what we noted that this prevalence for emphysema is true if you look at all COPD patients together. But when you really start to drill down of subsets of individuals with COPD, individuals with early onset COPD, individuals with the most severe emphysema, individuals who've reached goal grade four, what we really start to see is no difference by sex in the amount of emphysema, suggesting that there may be a subset of women who are particularly susceptible to parenchymal injury um, and the development of emphysema as a subtype of COPD compared to whether you look at the population as, as an overall. What about other pieces of the puzzle? What are the other nuances of COPD phenotypes? So this is a study uh, from the Boston Early Onset COPD study from Ed Silverman. And when he was enrolling individuals in this study that was looking at the most severe early onset cases, early onset defined as, as somewhere in the range of before age 52 or 55, the predominance was for a female predilection of early onset COPD. And this has been, again, um, recapitulated in the COPD gene study, and now we definitely uh, think that there is this subtype of, of young women who are particularly susceptible to COPD at an early age. So why could this be? Could this be, again, anatomy coming back and causing an issue, smaller lung size in women? Is there some other competing risk, shorter survival in men with COPD? Is there some X-linked genetic driver? And again, this is a topic Megan Harden and I are looking at. Are there hormonal issues? Is there underreporting of tobacco smoking? Are women really smoking more than we understand? And this is likely not the case because there have been many studies on the epidemiologic prevalence patterns of tobacco that really endorse the value of self-report. Are there other environmental factor, factors, or is there really an increased female susceptibility, which is what we ascribe to? We also see this female susceptibility in ACOS, the asthma COPD overlap syndrome. Um, and what we observed in the COPD gene study is that the asthma COPD overlap syndrome occurred more frequently in women, and it also occurred more frequently in African American women. Um, so again, as we think about COPD, as we think about asthma across the life course, it really behooves us to think of the asthma COPD overlap syndrome as well. And in this week's thorax, there's a really uh, excellent review of the ACOS syndrome for those of you who are interested in more information. So we know as we think of COPD, there are definite uh, differences in risk factors and, and risk factor susceptibility. A lot of this in the Western world is born out of tobacco use. Um, but we know that occupational and non-occupational exposures are important drivers of gender differences here. Uh, traditionally, the use of biomass fuels is something that is a, an important exposure that contributes to the genesis of COPD in the developing world. And what we also know is that 80% of COPD amongst non lifetime never smokers occurs in women. So there does seem to be um, additional risk factors beyond cigarette smoke that need to be further studied in a sex-specific context. So how are we doing as a field in pulmonary in getting this message out there that we need to do these studies? We need to get the literature informed for sex-specific issues in, in lung medicine. This is a, a sobering study that was published several years ago that looks at year on the x-axis rate of publication and publication trends on the y-axis. So across all disciplines, we have seen an upswing in research on sex-specific issues. But if we look specifically at our beloved subspecialty of pulmonary medicine, we're one of the poor performers in publishing research. We are the poorest performer in publishing research on sex-specific issues in, in lung disease. 
Um, however, if you think of COPD, we can pull out of the literature some very interesting and important studies. Uh, this is a study published by our own Bart Celli and Victor, well, our former own Victor Pinter Plata, um, that looked at cytokine levels in COPD by sex and noticed sex differences among smokers without COPD as well as with COPD uh, for IL-6, IL-16, and VEGF, suggesting that if you look at a, at a very a granular way, you can definitely start to see some potential inflammatory markers that differ by sex and could be potential drivers of COPD. If we think in terms of proteomics, um, there has been a nice study by Maxi Kohler who looked at a comparison of the proteome between males and female smokers with and without COPD. And what they interestingly observed were perturbations in proteins in females but not males with COPD. And they really suggested that this is supportive of sexual dimorphism in proteomic features. And these sex-specific pathways were interesting, had interesting links to macroautophagy, which is, which is now a, a very a lucrative place to be looking for drivers of lung disease. But if we think about genetics, as I said earlier, this is, this is really um, uh, not something I have time to fully explicate given the hour to talk about asthma and COPD trends, but we do see in the literature this, this growing interest in looking at the sex-specific genetic architecture of these diseases. And in this paper by Carol Ober, she really exhorts that failing to model sex-specific architecture will significantly hamper the detection of susceptibility loci for disease. Um, so this is a study Meg Harden and I have been working on to get to publication where we took um, uh, genome-wide genetics data and looked for sex-specific genome-wide uh, genetic signatures. And when we parsed the data by females and males, we saw this sex-specific peak in the CELSAR1 gene in females with COPD, um, but no such peak for males. And interestingly, uh, we're very excited about this gene because it does have a developmental phenotype. And we had uh, Sunita Sharma and Scott Weiss look in the fetal lung data set. And this is a gene that demonstrates early sexual dimorphism in gene expression during pseudocanalicular, uh, during the canalicular phase of lung development. So we, we are very excited about this finding and hope to follow it up. Uh, Rosa Feiner, who I know is here in the room in the back somewhere, is visiting us from Spain. She comes from Alvar Agusti's group, and she uh, and Alvar published a very nice paper recently in PLOS One, where they identified female-specific and male-specific uh, exp gene expression networks that were very sex-specific. The genes are different, the structure of the network is different, and really, again, starts having us think in this direction of sex-specific effects of exposure on the genome. We ourselves published a paper a few uh, months ago, Kimby Glass is the first author here, uh, where we took a network-based approach and we asked ourselves, if we look at a network level, if we look at the level of gene regulation, can we identify sexually dimorphic signatures in sputum from women and men with COPD or in blood from men and women with COPD? And what we see are traditional, what we call hairballs that we, that we look at in network medicine. But the most important takeaway message is what we saw when we looked at sputum. This is the, the female gene targeting. This is male. Same on this side. Um, that we see very, very different targeting of male and female gene networks, um, but not a lot of differences in gene expression. So somewhere between gene expression and gene regulation, we think, is some of the non-hormonal drivers of lung disease, um, specifically COPD. So what, how do we really bring all this together? Women have historically been excluded from clinical trials. And so it's nice to make these research summaries, but how do we really translate this into patient care? Um, early on, it was suggested that men and women would not differ in their response to therapeutics, whether they're for lung disease or any disease. So they were categorically excluded, especially if they were of child-bearing uh, age. But in 1994, the Institute of Medicine suggested that the inclusion of women was mandatory um, and that this was further, um, further supported in, 19, in another passage in another statement by the Office of Research in Women's Health that provided guidelines for the inclusion of women in studies, and it's now actually the law. You cannot exclude women. But again, if we look at the pulmonary literature, we have done very poorly in thinking about lung 
medicine in a sex-specific therapeutic fashion. There have not been a lot of publications here. There have not been a lot of studies that have been powered for considering sex as, an, as a potential uh, variable to consider independently in treatment outcomes. So we can look, we can find studies in COPD, we can find similar studies in asthma where we can pull out features um, that suggest sex-specific features of therapeutics. So in the Euroscope study, um, inhaled steroid use was associated with reduced phlegm production in men, in men but not women. These are one-off observations you really got to look for when in the literature. Um, and these are hard to find. Even in TORCH, one of the uh, biggest trials in for COPD, um, there weren't enough women, only a quarter of the individuals who participated in TORCH for women. So it really, as we develop new drug trials, as we think of how to motivate better therapies, we really need to make sure we have at least 50% women to be able to analyze these data in large trials by sex. So for COPD, we really think of how do we set a clinical agenda. We need to suspect COPD in women. We need to aggressively treat nicotine dependence because we know the drivers of nic nicotine dependence differ by sex. We need to really address quality of life and depression and some of the psychological comorbidities that come along with COPD. We need to address coping strategies and all the other features. But we also need to further understand hormonal influences. And we have a, a series of grants going out this summer to try to get at hormonal drivers of COPD. We, to re recapitulate, we do think that there is a role for estrogen. We know um, there is a complex interplay between xenobiotic metabolism of cigarette smoke and how estrogen upregulates P450 metab uh, metabolism and gene expression. So what we see in women is that there's a rap more rapid metabolism of cigarette smoke, but there's also uh, more rapid development of, of carcin carcinogens as well related to the metabolism of cigarette smoke. There's been a growing interest of sex steroid signaling in the lung. This is a really beautiful review by Sathish and colleagues where they summarize the complexity uh, of the activity of testosterone and estrogens and progesterones on the dendritic cells and all the cells that we uh, care about in the lung, including the eosinophil. Um, we know that androgens and estrogens have very specific impacts on immune cell proliferation. Uh, we know that estrogen is a T2 driver and androgens are a T1 driver. Um, and really bringing this all together is quite complex. Um, but we do need to, to start thinking in this direction. Uh, you can really uh, go through the literature and try to make summaries, but you really need to be mindful of the different effects of, of, of sex hormones on boys and girls and women and men and across the life course for asthma and COPD. But as we bring it all together, and Dr. Fanta charged me with talking about asthma and COPD, so it's quite a whirlwind tour, and I just have scraped the surface. But really what's important is to set a research agenda, and to set a research agenda that can be transformative in how we take care of patients. And this kind of research agenda needs to be multidisciplinary and collaborative. We need to think of sex and gender, and now we need to think of gender not only in and of itself, but gender identity issues because of the correlates that come along with gender dysphoria. We need to think in terms of animal models. There was um, an important message put out of the NIH last year which suggested that animal modeling should be done in both male and female mice. There's a big um, study going on right now in the lung called the lung map, and I spoke to one of the lung map investigators, and at this point they're still only doing male mice. Um, so I think even in some of the, the bigger initiatives, we still need to embrace that idea. <clears throat> Um, all basic study research needs to be inclusive of males and females, and that's including integrative genomics, which we're most interested in at the Channing. But this also means that as we try to take care of patients and be sensitive to sex and gender differences, we need to start education at the earliest levels. We need to educate pediatricians, we need to educate children and adolescents about the health risks related to smoking and the environment. Uh, one of the places we can really make inroads now is to engage in social media. Uh, there's a COPD campaign to do this, but to really engage social media to get sex-specific messages about lung health out there. Uh, and this, the way public health uh, becomes relevant here is not just about smoking, but about e-cigarette use. We see e-cigarette use amongst teenage girls on the rise, and we're very concerned about what that portends for the coming wave of COPD in the next decades. 
um, we need to really develop these partnerships. And I had the good fortune last two years ago now to, to um, speak at the State House on the issue of sex and gender and lung disease in, in the Commonwealth. And so there are constituencies that are very interested in the lung health of men and women in, in Massachusetts. And as we do this, we really need to motivate these sex-specific messages on how to better, better target um, uh, lung, lung initiatives. And so what about the lung center? So we have this lung center now at the Brigham Women's Hospital, and we really have an opportunity here to make some inroads in, in the study of sexual dimorphism in the lung. We can study smoking and the exposure of millennials. We can really look at the changing faces of lung disease and really drill down using multiple omics and to define sex-specific functional pathways. We really hope that the next years of studying hormones in the lung will be fruitful and really with the goal to get to sex-specific therapeutics. And in part of this, we'll be leveraging the power of, of social networking to move these forward in patient-powered research ne networks. But really, we see primary prevention for lung disease happening through precision medicine. And precision medicine really needs to be inclusive of this dialogue of sex and gender as it moves forward. So as the hour draws to a close, I was, I was, I was told to stop around 15 minutes too for questions. So I will leave you with this, does sex matter for asthma and COPD? And I hope this, this whirlwind tour suggests that sex does matter. It matters in ways we did not expect and undoubtedly it matters in ways that we have not yet developed and begun to imagine. So I thank you for your interest and I open it for questions. And that really was quite a whirlwind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And we'll take questions. Well, let me start with one. Yeah. So um, you, you did a beautiful job of talking about asthma and talking about COPD, and you talked about um, hormone, potential hormonal effects yeah. um, in asthma. Do we know anything about hormonal effects and susceptibility in smoking and COPD? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Elliot. So. I think this has been a place where we need more research. It's really not been well studied. We know of this complex uh, association of estrogen on the P450 xenobiotic metabolism of cigarette smoke, but how differences in hormone levels can impact the trajectory of COPD really has not been well studied. So we're proposing now to measure hormone levels in the COPD gene study. For those of you who don't know, COPD gene is a, is a uh, study of 10,500 individuals with and without COPD who have very, very exquisite phenotyping, including CAT scans of the lung, genome-wide genetics data, and we really hope that the addition of hormone information for the cross-sectional and longitudinal data there will allow us to answer some of these questions. So we have an intuition about the association of hormones with cigarette smoke metabolism, but not so much with COPD. Yeah. Yeah, so nowadays, you know, it's more acceptable uh, uh, the treatment for transgender, you know, so those that get hormone therapy are planned to include those in our study to follow up about the using of hormones? This is, this is a fabulous question because I think it's very timely. I think it's very important. I think there have been no very good studies of transgender individuals in lung health. We know that the use of exogenous estrogens are generally associated with increased risk of pulmonary embolism, but how they, there's also a very high rate of smoking amongst the transgender population, and that study by Ken Pickerton really highlights that. And so the combined use of very extraordinarily high levels of exogenous hormones together with high rates of smoking, I think will really provide important insights into lung disease, but will provide important opportunities of how better to care for the transgender community. But as far as I know, there's no one really focused on lung health and transgender individuals. Other questions? So just a clarification, I guess. Um, one, one of the uh, earlier slides uh, in the section uh, on asthma, I, I think you presented a table in sp uh, small studies in which hormone supplementation was given to see if control uh, of regulation of hormones would improve outcomes in asthma, and they were all negative. Is that true? So the randomized control trials, of which there have been a few, have been negative. But in terms of observational studies where small case studies of patients have been reported, there have been anecdotal improvements in asthma with 
better control of hormonal fluctuations through the use of OCPs. Now, one of the things we know nowadays is that the balance of estrogens and progestins in the OCPs is, is very tight. Um, and so different patients may respond differently to the different preparations. And I have not been aware of any study that has really looked by the different modern preparations and asthma outcomes. And there have been a lot of suggestions that we need to study this because PMA is a very important complicator mm -hmm. of asthma severity and asthma control, but it's really not been well studied. I have another question for you. So um, this one-third, one-third, one-third year with, um, with pregnancy, yeah. um, does that represent an opportunity to look at personalized medicine in the sense of Presumably, all these women are having similar um, hormone fluxes um, mm. during their pregnancy, but clearly, one set is going one way, one set is going another way. Has there been any kind of basic research looking into um, what might be causing yeah. uh, those differences? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because when I was a fellow, Dr. Fanta always used to say it's 30, 30, 30. And I look at the modern literature, that's what it still says 30, 30, 30. Um, but as far as I saw in my recent tromp through the literature, there's been no real investigation of these women side by side. I think mm -hmm. if we were to look at their genomics, we'd right. find something extraordinary. And because I think, yes, hormone fluctuations are tightly controlled. And we, but we know that hormones have non-genomic and genomic <laughs> impacts. And so I think it's really, what are these hormone fluctuations doing at the genomic level that are really the unanswered question? Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned was between cadmineo uh, symptoms, especially seen in women who are caffeine <coughs> sensitive. Mm. Uh, do you, um, I'm guessing A or D is what's implied there, but not necessarily true. Uh, Elliot, you did the study. <laughs> uh, no, the, the question is really whether that's an association that ha has to do with severity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the ARD patients um, tend to be much more severe. Aspirin exacerbate respiratory yeah. disease is what we're talking about. So they tend to be much more severe. So they are a better litmus test sometimes. Yeah. So, so small fluctuations might be much more obvious in a population that is severe and just takes a little bit to tip over. So that's one path. Or the possibility is that, um, that there's an actual mechanistic right. interaction between those. And we don't know. Um, that's where interesting to look at. Yeah, and, and that SARP paper, I think, really does raise that, that point about is this prostaglandin-driven and not estrogen. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Good. Okay, well, thank you again. This is great.